In our Exodus series, we've seen God rescue his people from nearly a century of slavery in Egypt, leading them through the Red Sea. With Pharaoh's army defeated, they are now well on their way to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. With God leading them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night, things are looking up until it all falls apart. Today's reading comes in four short segments, after which we're going to try something a bit more creative to work out what's going on. Now, can everybody turn to page um, 99? Oh, no, 98, sorry. So it's Exodus chapter 15, or oh, actually it's 99, <laughs> uh, starting from verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve springs and seventy palm trees, and they camped there near the water. Chapter 16. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month, when they had come out of Egypt, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord. Because he has heard your grumbling against him, who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning. Because he has heard your grumbling against him, who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Now let's go to chapter 17, verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink, Moses replied. Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, 
Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, struck the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. With Moses, Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hand grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady to sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites' army with the sword. Thank you, Lee Ching. Uh, let's pray. <coughs> um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Um, we thank you that it's been written for us and for our salvation. Um, so we pray today that in your word you might uh, confront us with the reality of what we are like, but more importantly, you might comfort us uh, by knowing how good and kind and gracious you are. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, can I ask you please to take out the leaflet? And today you can actually close your Bibles and have the leaflet open in front of you. Um, you'll see there's various verses that have been reprinted for you along the way. Um, and if you have that there, I'm not going to refer much to it, but if you have that there, it'll make sense of what I'm going to talk about. <coughs> well, after the wondrous heights of Exodus 14, uh, we saw last week God vanquished the Egyptian army at the Red Sea. Uh, things are looking up for the Israelites. We are told there, verse 31 of chapter 14, finally they put their trust in the Lord. So I wonder what you were expecting next. Feels like the scene is set uh, for the dawn of a new era, for a glorious next chapter in this bigger and better story that we belong to. Sadly, as you've just heard from the readings, it all comes crashing down in chapters 15 through 17. Uh, God's people grumble about the lack of water. They grumble about the lack of food. They grumble again about the lack of water. Even as the God who has brought them safe thus far comes through for them again and again and again. I realise that actually the readings that we've heard, they weren't especially uplifting or edifying, but they're important. They're important because of what they teach us about ourselves and even more so because of what they teach us about God. So today, to try and hear it clearly, I thought I'd try something a little bit different. I thought I'd ask us to try and think about this story from Moses' perspective. You'll see there on your handout, it says, through Moses' eyes. Now, to do this, you're going to have to imagine that I'm a Hebrew man from ancient times. Don't worry, I'm not going to dress up. Uh, but uh, I do have a prop that will make sense a bit later on. Okay, so here we go, through Moses' eyes. Oh my goodness, I have just about had it with these people. I tell you, I don't know why God hasn't given up on us. Because if I were God, I'm pretty sure I would have by now. I feel like these people are going to be the death of me. I reckon there's a good chance I'll never make it to the promised land at this rate. Why can't we trust him? Well, clearly God is with us. He is for us. He has done so much for us over the centuries. Let me tell you what happened after God parted the Red Sea. Uh, you might think of this as 
kind of like there's a picture on the screen, kind of like my travel diaries for what happened. Well, firstly, at Mara and Elam, without any water. Uh, three days into our journey and three days in the desert of Shur, and unsurprisingly, people are starting to get pretty desperate. There's no water, verse 22. Now, to be fair, it was pretty stressful. The kids were complaining, there's a scorching heat, not a sign of water anywhere, not a cloud in the sky. Eventually, we stumbled across a water hole at Mara, but to add insult to injury, it was stagnant and undrinkable. I guess that's why it was called Mara. Uh, in case you're not a Hebrew speaker, Mara just means bitter. So the people grumbled, verse 24. And I cried out to the Lord, and what he had me do was throw a piece of wood into the waters, and instantly we could drink. It was amazing. If you ever needed proof that God was still with us, here it was. The thing is, with the benefit of hindsight, I can see, and, you know, apparently today is a good day for dad jokes, so pardon the pun, I can see this was a watershed moment for us. Were we ever going to trust that God had things under control? And, verse 26, listen carefully to the Lord, our God, and do what is right in his eyes? Or are we destined to be no different from the Egyptians who kept refusing to listen to God until eventually they suffered the brutal consequences of those ten plagues and the Red Sea? To be honest, it actually felt like an omen, a sign of things to come because, well, it's not like we Israelites were any better or more deserving than the Egyptians. And yet, how foolish we are to doubt God. Because if he's brought us this far, he's hardly going to abandon us now. And actually, as if to make the point, God immediately led us to Elam. Uh, next slide, thanks. Elam, uh, with its 12 wonderful springs of fresh flowing water, its 70 shady palm trees to shelter under. Again, for you non-Hebrew speakers, Elam just means a place of strong trees in the middle of a desert. It felt almost as if God was just showing off. You know, kind of like a, a big neon sign in the sky, flashing lights saying, yes, you can trust me. And so, at this point, I was still a little bit optimistic of better things to come. That we turned the corner. That we were willing to give God a go. Well, point two, into the desert of sin. Now, there's no food. As we headed back into the desert, sadly, it didn't take long for the wheels to come off in a big way. Yeah, we filled up our water bottles at Elam. We had full water bags now, but food was starting to become a problem. Uh, this desert is, and this won't surprise you, it's even more deserted than Adelaide on a public holiday. <laughs> Things started to fall apart because, well, it became clear, the people really had no confidence in God to provide. Look at verses 2 and 3 of chapter 16 there on your handout. Uh, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you brought us out into this desert to starve this entirely assembly to death. Now, I've got to say, I nearly lost it at this point. <laughs> I really couldn't believe what I was hearing. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all day. Really? We've been slaves for the last century. We've been forced to make bricks without straw. One of the pharaohs had ordered the death of all of our baby boys just as a form of population control. But listening to the people complain now, you'd think that we've been at a beachside resort sipping pina coladas. Sad, isn't it? Sad how easily we can start to grumble when things don't go our way. You know, we humans... We have the most incredible capacity to rewrite history in a way that best suits the story we want to tell now. 
And surely you've done it as well. Maybe you've heard the words coming out of your mouth and you thought, am I really saying that? Of course, the reason why the complaining made absolutely no sense was because there was absolutely no way God was going to let us die in that desert. Not if he'd been with us ever since his first promise to Abraham, which he repeated to his son Isaac, and he repeated to his son Jacob, and he repeated to his son Joseph, and he'd kept through 500 years, through war and famine and childlessness, slavery, forced migration. Over and over and over again, we have seen that we belong to a bigger and better story, one that God is writing. And as I said before, if he's brought us this far, he's hardly going to abandon us now. If, for no other reason, then it would make God look like a fool if he did. In the end, all of our grumbling, it really amounted to disbelief in God, to not believing who he is, and why we know that we can trust him. Look at verses 6 and 7. In the evening you'll know that it was the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you'll see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard you grumbling against him. See, after God had rescued us from slavery in Egypt, and even now as he fed us each night and every morning, all of it was designed to convince us, verse 11, that he is the Lord our God. Which ironically is exactly what God had said Pharaoh would realise at the Red Sea. Chapter 14, verse 4, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Be sad if we can't learn the lesson in an easier way than the Egyptians did. Anyway, God sends us manna and quail. Just the right amount each day, every day. A quail for dinner, manna for breakfast. Uh, we called the bread manna and it tasted like wafers made with honey, verse 31. Uh, in fact, we called it the food of angels. There should be a picture on the screen behind me. I'm not much of an artist, but I thought I'd knock up a quick sketch for you. <laughs> Just so we'd never forget what it was like. The thing is, even as that crisis was averted, it's pretty obvious an unhealthy pattern was, depend was forming. See, we grumble. God comes through with the goods. But we don't really trust him, so we grumble again. And God comes through with the goods again. And the cycle keeps repeating. But it's actually more of a downward spiral. Because our complaints get even more bitter each time. And I was starting to get a pretty bad feeling about all this. Because sure enough, the next episode shows just how hard our hearts were. So point three then, on the right-hand side of your handout, at Rephidim, still no water. Oh, excuse me. On we went throughout the desert uh, until we come to Rephidim. And almost, almost right on cue, once again, the people grumble about the lack of water. Now, look, I get it's a problem. It's a desert. But it's as if they have no memory, as if they've completely airbrushed the incident at Mara and Elam, let alone the fact that God's now set up a daily food delivery of manna and quail for us. And look at verse 3 of chapter 17. But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. Uh, just as an aside, sometimes I wonder if it's easier, uh, maybe it's safer to blame our leaders rather than blame God himself. Uh, follow on with me, verse 3. Then they said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Uh, oh, yes, of course. That's exactly what God was doing. Yeah. God had this elaborate 400-year-old plan to rescue his people from slavery just so he could kill us in the desert. I'll say it again. If he's brought us this far, he's hardly going to abandon us now. 
So I was starting to get fed up, and I'm ashamed to admit it that I also complained to God at this point. (laughs) But my complaint was about the people. Verse 4, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. As an aside, I really need to do something about watching my temper. Unless God runs out of patience with me, and I don't make it out of this desert either. What's wonderful is that, unlike me, God is so incredibly gracious, much more so than I ever would be. So what he did was he told me to take my staff and to strike a rock. There's a picture on the screen behind me. Uh, Strike this rock and he says fresh water would flow, (laughs) which incredibly it did. I mean, it was unforgettable. Enough water flows for 600,000 men plus women and children. It was so incredible that people said we should give this place a name so we'd never forget it. Someone came up with the idea, the split rock, um, which you know, I suppose is technically true. But in my opinion, it doesn't really capture the essence of what was going on. I said we should call the rock the place Massa and Meribah. Which, again, if you don't speak Hebrew, Massa and Meribah, it just means quarrelling and testing. Because, verse 7, the Israelites tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord amongst us or not? Is the Lord amongst us or not? Really? Really? Is the Lord amongst us? Could we seriously doubt that he was? When he's been with us in a pillar of cloud each day. Right there in a pillar of fire each night. Well, whilst we're still splashing about in the water. It's kind of like wet and wild that day. God proved once again that he was still with us because out of nowhere, the Amalekites attack. So point four, Rephidim part two, the Amalekites attack. Uh, We got news of it late one night. Everyone knows that the attack's going to come first thing in the morning. And so to be honest, it was a pretty terrifying night. It's true, just recently, the Red Sea had been the downfall of the Egyptian army. But this time we're in a desert. There's nowhere to run. There is nowhere to hide. Except God is with us. So at daybreak, I go out uh, and, verse 9, stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. And as long as I hold up my hands, we are winning the battle. Now you might have noticed there that um, I started calling it the staff of God, not my staff actually here's the prop I brought it along with me the staff of God man I love this stick it goes everywhere with me now I never put it down now I don't know if you've ever tried but um, dawn to dusk that's a long time to hold up your arms in fact I didn't last long. Mum are really hurting. So thankfully, Aaron and her, they held my arms up for me. You know, I didn't think that was cheating. I thought that was okay. Actually, my, pic- my kids drew a picture. Here's what it looks like. It's such a relief to know that I don't have to do all this on my own. Because I've got to say, I was just so weary from everything. So, those are my travel diaries so far. That's what happened. I said at the start, I'd tell you what I've learned about us, but more importantly, what I've learned about God and what he is like. So, if you look on your handout, here's the last thing for me to talk about today. Firstly, what I've learned about us. Today, do not harden your heart. Today, do not harden your heart. 
Sometimes I wonder how future generations will remember us. I wonder how our story will be told, particularly if we never make it out of this desert. I wonder, because actually I worry, to be honest, our legacy is not looking very good at the moment. There's no easy way to sugarcoat it, so I'll just be blunt. Please, whatever you do, whoever you are, whatever your particular situation, don't be like us. Don't do what we did. Please, I beg you, learn from our mistakes. Don't repeat them yourself. Uh, or, in the words of a song that I've been working on, and that I'm hoping will catch on, today, do not harden your heart. And you'll see some of the lyrics I've printed there for you. Actually, um, I thought I'd try them out on you. I've um, I borrowed a tune from a band called Oasis, which I think is quite funny, actually. <laughs> Here we go. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. Oh, that's enough. Let's stop with that. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I realise it's not easy to trust God. You know, just as we had to pass through a desert to get to the promised land, <laughs> that was no cakewalk, I know that you also face countless hurdles and obstacles and challenges every day. You deal with disappointment and pain, suffering and loss, unmet expectations and unfulfilled desires. And the list goes on. And I know that when you do, no matter how prepared you are, it's tempting to look for someone to blame. It's tempting to harden your heart and to grumble. After all, that's what everyone else does. I wonder, why are we so quick to complain? Is it because, deep down, we think that we have a God-given right to expect that things will work out the way we want them to? Is it because so much of our society is powered by discontentment? Envy at someone else's success? We spend so much time comparing up as opposed to comparing down. You think about how politics works. Politics is basically someone saying, vote for me and I'll make your life better than the other guy will. Or maybe marketing and advertising, which at the heart of it basically says, unless you buy my product, you are missing out. Your life is incomplete. Why are we so quick to grumble? Uh, I once heard it said, and uh, it's a nice phrase, I've printed there for you on your handout. Grumbling is not a minor sin. Grumbling is not a minor sin. And our time in the desert is proof. Because complaints always escalate. They very rarely diminish. Now, don't mishear me. I'm not saying that as God's people we should pretend that everything is all roses all the time. Often it's not. I'm not saying that as God's people uh, we're meant to bottle up our worries and silently fume at God if he doesn't care or is not interested. And I'm not promising that God will make everything better just because we ask him to. I mean, look at us. Yes, he gave us water, and then he gave us food, and then he gave us more water, 
and he protected us from the Amalekites, but he didn't just fast forward us to the promised land, to the land flowing with milk and honey. In fact, it's going to take us years to get there. So he doesn't give us everything whenever we ask for it, but given his track record, his track record, not just with our generation, but for hundreds of years, we really have no reason to doubt him. We have no excuse not to trust him. So what's the antidote? What's the antidote to grumbling? Well, here's the other thing that I've learnt. There on your handout. It's about God. He is trustworthy. He is trustworthy. You know, there's so many things that I could say about God. He is patient. That he loves us. That he's powerful. That he's never taken by surprise, even by our failings. But I think the thing that I've learned most about God through all of this is that he is trustworthy. He is faithful to his promises. Because in that bigger and better story that you and I belong to, he promised to bless Abraham and his descendants. He promised to bless them with a land and to make them into a great nation. And through us to bless all the peoples of the world... And after 500 years, half a millennium of running with this plan, nothing is going to stop him now. Not even our faithlessness. Which would have given him the perfect justification for walking away. God is trustworthy. And sometimes when I wonder if God's patience will ever run out... I'm comforted by the words of a much better song that someone else has written. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is new every morning. And his grace, which has brought us safe thus far, it will surely lead us home. We join me in praying. In the words of Hebrews chapter 3, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We've come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear your voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing together.